Today is the Feast of Corpus Christi, and it's a time for the Church to meditate on the mystery of the Eucharist outside of Holy Week. And I think probably if you're like me, you've thought more about the Eucharist in the last two years than you ever did before. I can remember celebrating the Eucharist during the height of COVID in my backyard and thinking, can I have the Eucharist if the people at St. John's cannot? We went through a whole series of, of steps to provide safety for each other. Remember the, the, the uh, tweezer time? That was really difficult. But it was so important for us to figure out a way to be fed. So central in our life is the recognition of God's giving of God's self to us physically. In our liturgy, there is a tension. And it reflects the tension, I think, in the moment in the Episcopal Church. Do, do many people know that there's an there's a argument going on in the Episcopal Church now about communion? How many people know that? Because it's usually a priest argument, uh, but, but you're gonna hear about it this summer. And the, the, the theological argument uh, is whether people can come to communion without being baptized. And there's some compelling arguments on both sides. But in, in our liturgy, I want you to listen to this. This is what we say each and every Sunday. This is the banquet of the Lamb. It is made ready for those who love him and for those who want to love him more. So come, you who have much faith and you who have little, you who have been here often and you who have not been here long. You who have tried to follow and you who have failed. Come, because it is the Lord who invites you. It is the Lamb's will that you should meet God here. And immediately after that, immediately after that, it says the communion of the people. All who have been baptized have examined their hearts and wish to receive our Lord Jesus Christ truly present in the sacrament are welcome to the Lord's table invitation and boundary. There's a tension there. At its best, it might be a creative tension. Invitation and boundary. There are many, many ways to understand the Eucharist. One of them, which I think is profound and beautiful and deeply, deeply scriptural, is to look at the Eucharist through the lens of committed marriage. In the Old Testament, the sense of God being wed to God's people is shot through all of the scriptures. At the giving of the law at Sinai, it's seen almost as, well, it is, it's marriage vows. I will be your God, you will be my people. And here's our vows together committed, loving, life-giving relationship. And the people of Israel again and again and again came back to that long, long love story between God and God's people. It's a story of betrothal. It's a story of broken marriage vows by Israel and renewed ones by God. Even in, in that beautiful passage from the Song of Songs, it talks about God and Israel exchanging a kiss. Now, I got a lot of wide-eyed looks at 8 o'clock by that. I, I don't write the scriptures, I just report them. But that's there, that intimacy, that physical intimacy is embedded in the scriptures over and over again. The intensity of human passion is used to try to describe God's passion for humanity. Israel is proclaimed God's bride. Now, if that language does not work for you, if it's too patriarchal or too gendered, jettison it. But leave 
that intimacy, that longing, that passion, relationship in place. Because that's what the scriptures are proclaiming. And against all of that, immersed in all of that, John the Baptist comes in John's gospel and says that Jesus is the bridegroom. He is the bridegroom. Jesus himself refers to himself as the bridegroom. People complain that his disciples don't have the seriousness that you should have around the issue of fasting, and he says, why would they fast? Why would a wedding guest fast when the bridegroom is there? The wedding guest can fast when the bridegroom is no longer there. But for right now, I, the bridegroom, the betrothed of Israel, and the people of God is with you. The number of parables in the Gospels that talk about a wedding feast and the role of the bridegroom are numerous. Jesus knows his role as the lover of souls, the betrothed of God's people. The book of Revelation joins Israel's betrothal to God, Jesus' understanding of his idea that he is the bridegroom, and the gift of himself the gift of himself in the Eucharist. It understands it this way. Rejoice and exalt, and give Christ the glory, for the wedding of the Lamb has come, and the bride is made ready herself. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Revelation sees the Eucharist as the wedding supper of the Lamb sign and seal of God's committed, free, faithful, fruitful, spousal love. St. Augustine, one of the great, great theologians in the history of the church, agrees. He says that every time we come to the table, every time we receive the Eucharist, it is renewal of marriage vows. Bridegroom, an individual, lived out in relationship. Bridegroom, individual, and community lived out together in a physical way. He is present, not just spiritually, but bodily. The bridegroom tells us, this is my body. It is given for you. That's not so different than that beautiful, beautiful phrase, with my body, I thee worship. That wonderful phrase from our old marriage rite. The bride and the groom say, with my body, I thee worship in their vows. When a couple consecrate their marriage, they echo the words of Christ in giving their body to each other in a sacred union. This self-giving of Jesus' body, this image of the spousal love of God between God and Israel is made almost inconceivable in a new way. Before it was just about being present together, but with Jesus offering his body, it becomes a physical union with God. This is my body given for you, take it. Our prayer book, Wedding Rite, echoing the letter of the Ephesians, offers the same viewpoint. The bond and covenant of marriage was established by God in creation. It signifies to us the mystery of the union between Christ and his church. Back to the whole question of invitation and boundaries. Being hospitable is what the church should do. But the church also has to understand itself as creating a boundary of faithfulness. Do you know the Lord? I, I always ask people, you know, when we do prenuptial counseling, do you really know each other? That's what, it, that's what the whole series of questions is, do you know each other? And perhaps a boundary is about knowing, being committed, loving, not closed. There's invitation to come into the community, invitation to join this relationship to, for all people, but there's a boundary that creates meaning. I think looking at the Eucharist as a sacrament of the 
bridegroom and the bride, where both Christ and the church have mutual self-offering, can help us understand this question of boundaries. Boundaries create meaning. Jesus is asking us into a sacramental relationship, but he is also asking us to forsake all others. Just as our marriage vows talk about that. Do you forsake all others? I was just reading something a woman wrote about, she felt that her husband was not forsaking all others because he came home from work every night and was constantly on his phone and wouldn't talk to her. So maybe forsaking all others is a bigger issue. Forsaking all others. You know, and that, in a marriage moment, marriage ceremony, that's beautiful. And it's moving. No one has ever at a wedding I have done said, jumped up from the back and said, forsaking all others, that's so inhospitable. They're attractive, charismatic people. They should be with everybody. We don't say that. Because we understand the beauty of boundaries that create meaning. To come to communion is to come into physical intimacy with Christ the bridegroom, who offers us his body, a wedding, a sacred union. And when we enter that sacred union, Therefore, it is not to be entered into unadvisedly or lightly, but reverently, deliberately, and in accordance with the purposes for which God instituted it. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb.